Hello and welcome back to another episode of Getting Into Good Oxide. Hello and welcome back, Sydney. Hi, Sebastian. Uh, after a refreshing weekend, we can get back to our handle situation here, which we left in a strange state where we were forced to create extra clones of handles and cloning this was kind of not so obvious what it really does. And uh, you only do that to get another slot for an object buffer, which is conveniently hidden here, right? You can find an object and it just magically lives, even though a buffer in the background is located that is actually reused, which is the whole point so that it doesn't locate buffers all the time. Um, but there was only one buffer per handle. So I had to do this. And if you wouldn't, it would not run. There would be a runtime error and this would error out. Okay. So let's just see what the most natural version of this would be because in theory, just one handle is enough. No handle too. And we just keep the objects that we want here alive. Object ref, this is just an object for us. It shouldn't be necessary to call it ref. Um, is there any other ref around here? There's a tree ref. So that's more like how you want to think of that. Once you have an object, you have, you have the real deal. And that should work, ideally. That's the more natural way of writing it. And now it does work, which is an improvement that was done to this handle. So now it can handle or have any amount of object buffers for you and keeps them in a list. So when once you have the first yeah. object, it locates this for you. And it reuses it. Sorry? Looks a lot nicer from the outside. <laughs> yes. And it's still not there uh, because here commit tree, that should be, I mean, ideally our commit object is a real commit object and tree is a real tree and not an object ID. So ideally commit tree gives us the tree instead of forcing us to do a find object here. So maybe that's also something we can uh, try to improve which might be the goal for today to improve one of these things and make them nicer. And technically, this is the easiest, I think. So goal would be to do this. And it's a tree. Yeah. Knowing to tree, yeah, exactly. API wise, I think that is also very, very nice. Yes, true. And Git repository should be nice. That's its goal. This is why it's there. Um, and I think in the last episode, uh, I tried to make, uh, or I tried to rationalize this and said, but it's, you know, it's kind of, it's okay, the trade-offs and so on. Then we check the Git2 implementation or Git2 bindings. And they also give you the real deal when you ask for the tree and not just an ID. Thus, the baseline is higher and should be met. There's still really low baseline here. Okay, so for today, let's improve this line to make this work. If we do that now, um, it very much does not work. Let me put, put that down here. Okay, because it's still, this commit object here is not a real, um, not the kind of commit object that we want. It's the commit ref, which is a low level one. Uh, let's see what the terminology is here. To tag either, I'm just trying to find like the status quo, where, where do we get a tree? Try to commit, interesting. I'm a bit blind here. Um, I here find object and then into tree. So there's an into tree somewhere. So maybe we can call that into commit. And into commit should give us to transform this whole thing into real commit. And that should also fail. Okay, it's not there. 
that into tree is there. Uh, I wonder where that is implemented. Why did I not find it? Into tree. Ah, yeah, it's different input blocks here. <laughs> so there's one that is just for these lower level objects, apparently. And there's one that is just for the higher level objects. And I guess it should be easy enough to add an into commit here, transform this object into a commit or panic if it is none. Oh, this does not exist yet. <clears throat> okay, let's see the existing structure here. We are in easy. Easy object tree we have. Uh, we are in the mo module here. Where's the, where's the tree coming from? Is this defined somewhere down here? Start tree. Where's it coming from? Yeah, it's somewhere here in this file. I just was unable to find it. Okay. So, a decoded object which, which acts with access to its own repository. Yeah, it's a bit sad to see me do this, but it's mostly copy paste because it's really the same thing uh, structurally. Mm. Decoded commit object with access. And that's now called commit. The ID of the commit. The fully decoded. Fully decoded, yeah, it's decoded, like it's the back buffer of the object. Mm -hmm. But I was now a bit confused because it's not, you actually didn't parse the data yet, but you did decode it. So decode first and then parse later. So I guess it's okay to say that. Um, yeah, these buffers are now owned. This is part of the change we did with the um, unlimited free list of buffers. And of course, we keep the handle itself. And then we implement drop for commit. This is super important to not forget because this is where the reuse happens. So as we drop this commit object, it hands its buffer back to the handle. And the handle really just has a free list where it pushes the um, vectors on top of. This means that the next object you will create, it will just take an existingly existing allocated buffer from the free list. And if you're lucky, it's big enough to hold the new object. This is how you avoid allocations. And if you're unlucky, maybe you're lucky enough to get a realloc, then it can just grow in place, so to say, but this is a matter of luck. But yeah, um, I guess after a bunch of you know objects that you've decoded, your buffer will your buff first will be big enough to more or less handle most objects that you want to put in there and yeah it's it's having having a reusable buffer list for these it's really making a difference i can tell you that much as well um, performance wise because the same technique is used for um, caches like the object caches they're sometimes you know they, they always use a free list as well so they reuse the buffers that they have otherwise it would be a massive load on the um, on the heap, which that way you can pretty much avoid. Yeah. All right. Now we have commit and into commit. Um, but I think, oh, where's that? We must be in some we must be in a different module here because I don't see, I, I wonder why commit isn't available. Where's, where's that coming from? Ah, yeah. Which? Easy. So here it's coming from, I'm just a bit confused. So it, it, imports these from the top level easy even though it's an easy 
object. So it imports it from, from here because it's, ah, it's an easy tree. It's an easy commit. It's an easy object. And then we are in this object module, which basically deals with the top level object implementation. So all these methods are implemented here. So that this isn't, isn't in the easy top level here, it's just structures mostly. And uh, in the same object module, we then have object tree for the tree uh, implementation and object commit for everything that is related to that um, co easy commit that we're now doing. Okay, but this also, you know, this try into uh, still confuses me a little because try into that's the official conversion trait here. So there should be some from implementation that says from commit, uh, from object into try into commit, try from object into commit, so to say, and we don't mm -hmm. have that yet. So this should not work. And probably this should also be commit. I try to use mm, as commit, but was another kind. Okay. Try into, here we have it. This is the relevant one, not implemented for easy commit. That's fair because we didn't actually implement this. So this, this is something I try to do. When you have one object that converts into another, you should probably implement these from and try from traits. So from commit can always, a commit can always become an object because object can represent anything that is, is available. It just remembers the kind. So you see, it really just removes this kind and puts it into a type that is always okay. itself, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's all it does. And then this allows you to bring it down to the functionality that is only relevant for this kind of object here, even though it's still not parsed. So that's something that might be interesting here because Maybe this is also why I didn't I didn't wrap this because now we have to also figure out how to give access to the low level um, to the low level information and how to do that more or less efficiently and mm. you will see that um, I mean I predict kind of borrowship borrow borrowing ownership kind of issues. Um, uh, let's let's get there when we get there. All right. Now, where is where's the from implementation? Um, and it's also maybe a bit hard to find that. Try from object for tree. This is the one. So it looks like uh, here, object impulse. So there's a bunch of trait impulse just dumped here because they're also pretty repetitive. Um, let's see what it does for object, uh, for tree before we change this. Or copy paste probably again. This is also the place where you might wanna have uh, a macro if you don't hate <laughs> macros. <laughs> That's probably macroable, otherwise you keep changing four places, uh, which are the same. Maybe that's uh, an opportunity we might pick sometime. For now, I'm just into the simple thing that is simple for me, so copy paste. Copy paste it is. Yeah. There's other places uh, where that's not the case, where I did write the macro that was needed because copy paste was too painful as well to see all this bloat. But here it still kind of seems okay-ish with a couple of lines which are also simple, like just structural, structural change. Okay. Interesting. So that seems to be a problem uh, with the uh, IntelliJ 
sense. Mm -hmm. It's also new, I guess. Maybe a new bug introduced there. But anyway, what does it do? It keeps the, it gets the object, then it stores the handle for later. For some reason, uh, the reason is here because later we want to drop value and get a new free buff, which is the previous one. So here we kind of abuse the knowledge of the free list. This is single threaded code, so nothing else can happen once we drop this. The data buffer is put back onto the free list and then I take it back. Uh, now that I'm, yeah. yeah, now that I'm thinking about this, I'm wondering, does it have to be that complicated because it's just owned? Answer is, yeah. So, quick question for you, actually. So this works because it really just says take the buffer back and then give me the buffer, but it drops the original value. So the destructor is called this value is gone. And no more magic happens when drop is called, right? So this is the key principle here that you try to trigger the magic because then you know there should be this extra buffer. But what pr would prevent me from doing something like this? Value data, just assign it. Um, we can't move. Oh, actually we can move, look at this, but Yeah, okay. Get that far. So first I guess we have to finish, fix this and then... Easy commit, that one. The error type, also maybe interesting, it returns itself. So if it's the wrong type that you try to convert into, it just returns itself as the error type so that you don't lose the object. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of typical. That's something you see in the Rust standard library quite a bit, um, where they return the original if it's otherwise consumed. So you're not, <laughs> you know, try that. And then, oops, it's gone. Sorry, failure. Have to start over. Yeah. It's pretty cool, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Just so nice. It's, um, yeah, it's not nice to work with, unfortunately, because that's not a real error. So you can't just error out of stuff. You have to now deal with it. Um, mm. Uh, this is probably also why most people won't use that, um, but instead uh, use the existing functionality provided by these methods. Uh, all right, so now we do create. So if we are a commit, then we create a commit. That is all of these things. Otherwise, we turn ourselves. And now the issue should go away. Yes, kind of. Now we just don't have anything implemented on that, which is expected. But here, a message. Okay. And then the tree. So maybe we can, for now, can we get rid of that? Not really. Okay. Still a problem. But let's see if we can try something else here. Maybe also, whoops, do it on this one, which is which allows us to revert more easily. So value data. Why can't I do this? Let me compile. Okay. So I want to just move this data in here because I own it, right? Mm -hmm. But it says cannot move out of here. So it really wants to move, but it cannot move because it really just only accepts copy. So we could clone here, but that defeats the purpose. But here's the answer, I think. Cannot move out of easy object, which implements the drop trait. Why do you think that is? I'm not sure. Is it expecting to be dropped because yes. because of the implementation there, or yes? Let's look at the drop implementation. This is commit, but it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Look at drop. In order to drop, 
you need to get a mutable version of yourself, fair enough. Right, okay. But, of course, you've got the right to expect this to be full, complete, and not partially moved. Like, you want the whole body, not some limbs removed. Otherwise, you wouldn't mm -hmm. know what you have. So, makes sense. In order for this to be callable, you must not partially move stuff. That makes sense. Yeah, of course. Of course it does, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Right? It makes sense, but you don't think of it until... Yeah, you actually try to use drop and then stuff you did all mm. the time, remove parts, uh, doesn't work anymore and you have to think differently again. And yeah, that's rust for you, but also it does make sense. Um, so that's probably... Again, kind of hidden away again, right? With the, with the drop, I mean, yeah, you have to think a bit between the lines essentially. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, the compiler at least warns you. This is the interesting part here. The other stuff might be more confusing if you read the red first, then you wonder why I don't need copy. I always move things yeah. out of stuff. I always do partial moves. Okay, this, this doesn't work. So this would work. Okay, now we are back to the previous error. So that did work. But what would that do? Like if you would clone here, what would happen? Because value will be dropped. Let's not forget, right? Value was moved here, and at the end of this function um, or method, it will yeah, be dropped. Yeah, so you create an extra buffer, essentially, because yes. you clone the data before the other one is freed, so you have one extra allocation of the buffer. Yeah. Yes. So I force an allocation. I don't reuse the existing buffer. I duplicate my buffers. So each time you do this, you kind of have one buffer more on your free list, even though you never kind of had that many objects. So that's a bit of a... Yeah, it's a bit of a of an unnice tea, I guess. Because what happens, like the previous buffer, this one will be cloned, so you get an allocation for sure, which is what you want to avoid. The other buffer will be removed, and then you are back to where you were before once this object is dropped. So it's not that you're leaking data or something, just that you do an allocation for sure that otherwise you wouldn't you don't need for sure. You can just take somehow take this data. Okay. So this is why, you know, maybe there's another way instead of cloning, you can take the data. Is this uh, the right spot here? Yes. I'm a bit surprised that, that this is now claiming to be fully changed, but I think the diff algorithm now changed its, makes sense. Now diff thinks this was three and these two things have changed and this is completely new because that is now <laughs> too different. So now this should change again, huh? Or not? Okay, fine. Because I remember I didn't edit this because that was, yeah, this was fully green. Okay, now I edit this one. This is back to normal. <laughs> And here we have value dot data. I could try to just replace it with the default value as to be mem mem take. Okay. Make it mutable. And now what what does mem do? Mem take. Uh, you said it kind of swaps out the data, right? It kind yeah. of, yeah, does an in-place swap. Yeah, replace, swap. It does a mem replace. You can also call that function with t being defaulted. So swap takes the data and puts the default vector and empty vector in there. And that's better because now you take the existing so it, allocation. Oh, okay, so it puts an empty back to the original data where you're taking it from and takes the yanks that out essentially and puts it into the new one. Mm -hmm. And that, okay, and that avoids an allocation because you default to an empty buffer. Yes. And then what happens? So now value is dropped and then mm -hmm. it puts the empty buffer, which is an empty vector. It's useless. It's not even an allocation. It's, it doesn't have an allocation. It puts that onto the free buffer list which makes that useless. Um, 
and then again, then it's there. So we have an empty useless vector there that will be allocated next time somebody uses this. So okay, yeah. we kind of have then one buffer more than we should have on the free list. So the free list then has one more. So it's still the same mm -hmm. problem. And this Even is though it ends, it's empty, that doesn't that doesn't really change much. Yeah, I mean the emptiness doesn't change how it's usable later, but it's not helping you with performance or anything like that. So mm -hmm. the opposite is true. You do more, uh, have more buffers to handle, vector grows more, stuff like that. Okay, and yeah, and this is why there is no other way but to trigger the destructor, get the buffer from there, and then take it back using this. Uh, internal function here that accesses the free list. Just to be sure, as we reuse a buffer, we push it to the end, and as we take a free buffer, we pop it um, from the end. So yeah, push, pop seems to be fine. And that's that. Okay, cool. Now, two things we have to fix, and then this should even work. Let's have a way to get the message and a way to get a tree. Maybe the tree first, because that seems more obvious, maybe. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably that would be it, because we have to call functions. We don't have fields for this. We didn't parse the object yet. The commit is not yet parsed, but it is decoded. OK. So here we have the mod. Let's create a new module. Mod tree is here. Mod commit. And then we impl the easy commit. And we know we want the tree, for example. Habit and tree self. And every commit has a tree. So in theory, that should not be fallible, cannot fail. Okay. But of course it can fail. So I don't know yet what to what to return here. Because all we have is data, and now we have to do something with it, right? We have to decode that data. And now, I mean, the naive way would be to say git object um, commit from decode. How's what? What's this called? Okay. Yeah, for getting the API, there's a way to parse this. I would expect. <laughs> uh, let's see, decode. Yeah, that's the decoding itself. Where is it? From bytes. See, there is from bytes. I was wondering. Ah, it's commit ref. What was I looking at? I was looking at the owned object. Sure. We are not owning this, we are just decoding and the data itself from the buffer will be referenced. So commit ref from bytes, see? Makes sense, self data. Okay, and that can fail, see? What do you do now? I mean, it's okay to my mind to expose this here to expose the decode error. Also, what that means is that you are decoding the whole object, even though you only want one piece of it. There's no way around it anyway, right? Well, there is partial parsing. Mm -hmm. There is commit ref either. Oh. And then let's see this, these ref iders, they already have some utility functions here. I find it. That's maybe IntelliJ knows that. So there is a thing that you can use to call the tree ID. And this does what it has to do. 
it gets one token, ignores errors, ignores decode errors, and then gives you, uh, tries to convert that into a tree ID. Mm -hmm. So this is a parser token and we see this can be a tree, this can be a parent, author, whatever fields are available in the commit, you get them returned one by one. So the parsing is done stepwise and you control that with the, the iterator. Okay. So essentially you can iterate over individual tokens and once you have what you want, you don't have to iterate over everything. But do you have to, I mean, you're calling tree ID here. Mm -hmm. How does it know to look for the tree ID? How does it know to look for the tree ID? I mean, or do you have to handle that one level further up? Yeah, I mean, this is just the tree ID now, and now we could look mm -hmm. it up. Now we can make it, turn it into an object, which is what we want here. I mean, mm -hmm. we know for sure that we want to have a tree here, an easy tree. And it's going to be, oh yeah, right. We do have a repo here. And that's going to be tied to our repo for sure. And now we just have to look it up. That's the tree ID and it's an actual object ID, but it might not be there because if decoding fails, this just reduces, you know, it just doesn't care about errors, but it cares about the possibility of an error. So it degenerates mm -hmm. information here. Uh, if you don't want to degenerate information, you can just do this yourself. You can call next yourself and then you handle errors differently. But the thing is, the reason I do this here is that it's a standard commit object. So you decoded it already, which is probably the most dangerous thing to do in terms of error sources, because you touch disk and you know lots of things happen. But once you have these bytes, then all you have to do is parse them. And if they are valid, you can parse them. And why would they be invalid, you might ask? Because usually Git creates them or implementation creates them that know how to write a commit object. So this is like, it just should not happen to ever not be valid here, but it can. And these APIs, they will do their best not to just panic because they assume it shouldn't happen because I can still create a commit object myself in a shell script that will totally be wrong. And then this would crash here, right? So we don't want to panic. We just, we just say, okay, you care, you deal with it, caller. But we don't tell you what exactly happened because that shouldn't happen. And as a matter of fact, this parsing here for commits and trees and all the good object by default, it doesn't compile nice error messages in at all. So you see only parsing failed. So you have kind of these null errors that don't tell you anything, but they're also very light and kind of accelerate the whole, um, accelerate the thing a little bit. So 0.75% faster parsing thanks to not having uh, elaborate error. Hand I mean, error handling is elaborate. It handles everything, but uh, you don't see what the problem was. You can't really debug what the problem was. And that's the default. So you wouldn't even know much, even if it would give you an error, unless you compile it with that special compile flag, um, which most applications won't do. All right. Now, how do we deal with this? The fallibility. Do we expose this as option here? Or do we panic? It's a tough, it's a tough thing to, it's a tough question. What does git ox, what does libgit2 do? So we should have a tree method here, commit tree. And it gives you a result. Okay. Result. And it can error. Yeah, it's it's a bit hard to see. It's really just some error code. 
Is there some, it's an integer. Okay. So it's hard to see what that error could be, but it's just a bundle of all kinds of errors that are an integer. Okay. So I'd say, since it's so rare that anything goes wrong, at this point, I'd still say we have to push responsibility for the possibility of invalid, invalidly formatted. I mean, ugh. that's the thing. I mean, at least you have to give a return option. Yeah. Then it's just a question of if you want to return any more information than that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean. Yeah, can't return more information because we don't have it ourselves. Exactly. Normally, you have to make something up. Yeah. We can force compiling Git object with this uh, feature toggle that gives us more elaborate errors. But then I would expect only applications who are like something like file system check that actually want, that want to invest some extra time to do that, they would compile that in. But a Git repository is not the one to choose this. And I think those who want to implement that kind of thing, they would just do this themselves. They decode objects themselves and then handle errors themselves accordingly. Um, so this is not the place. It can fail in Git too. So people might say it's okay that it can fail here. Think about it. There can always be a lookup error. So when we do find object, so that's just one error source. Find object is another error source here. Mm -hmm. So we want an existing object there and that might not be present. And that's this kind of error here. So I think from from that standpoint it makes sure make makes sense to say we can actually elevate this option here with okay or else to an to a more elaborate error that says decode error, but it doesn't say what it is, it just couldn't be decoded or something a strange commit mm -hmm. object found. And then from there, we can take the tree ID and find that object mm -hmm. and convert it into what we want it to be. Okay, and that's how the implementation would have to look like. Then error handling, always a pleasure. Um, I usually solve this with copy pasting, but we can also write this one here. Ah, so the errors, they probably are going to be pretty much the same because we try to find an object and we try to decode it. So decode and find can go wrong. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how to, how to call that. Good. Uh, like also where that would be easy object tree error. Easy object commit error. Yeah. So let's make this public then. Oh, and then we have. Oh, this error type. Derive debug and then this error. Error. Is it? Is it this? Yeah, I think that's the one. This our error. So now we make this a bit more easy to write for us. Let's find examples, please. Okay. So error transparent is so something I usually do because that just says this is really just a hierarchy of errors. And we don't really mm -hmm. add our own information to it. Um, and find existing object is exactly what can go wrong here. Later. And then we can have a decode error. Commit decode can fail. And that's really because we don't have information about it. We can now say the commit could not be 
decode it where they are partially. And now this is the display message of that particular error variant, which also allows us to up upgrade this option here to pub use error. So now you see I isolate all the extra imports that might be needed. I put them into their own module so that they don't mix with what I have in my mod module above just to keep things separated. And then I publicly import this here. So now the path to this is um, easy object commit error. So this is also... Uh, hmm? I've never actually seen this pub use, I mean, publicly importing. Does that also just mean you're automatically exporting it as well? Yes. So this means now, I mean, to the to cargo doc and to the API user, it will look like this module isn't there at all, but this type mm -hmm. is there, like it was always there. Okay. This is how you can have your own little separation, but then move types into the place where they should be. That's yeah. cool. I think so too. There, you can do a lot of cool things with modules and you're not really... It can do everything with that. It can do any kind of organization to the point where you probably don't understand anymore what that is supposed to be, but you can. Okay, so now we know better. We have a result of a tree and an error. And now here we can say error decode. Mm -hmm. Option becomes an error if it's none. And we bail out. And then we should be able to use our handle to find an object. Interesting, huh? Now, now we are commit and we find our tree object. Previously, we couldn't do that really because we would need some sort of buffer that is already consumed by ourselves because we just parsed our own buffer. But now we can just say, well, we now want to have a tree too. And you want that to happen, easy, yeah. Now it deserves its name, easy commit. So we find that, now we got an object, this can fail, and then we want to co convert that into, tr into a tree. <laughs> and that's the next thing, we can say try into tree. Oh, speaking of. Should be a try and to commit to. Huh? So this makes it easier to find these from or try from implementations because invoking them is not that easy. You always have to kind of make a let binding, give it the type, and work your way backwards. I don't. I don't know if it's true to say that, but yeah, it's ni nicer to sometimes say just. Oh, I've got an object, dot, and then what can I do with that, right? That's how you use your IDE. And not the, the try from stuff, that's something you have to know. So it's hard to discover. And this is the discovery of that trait. Yes. Um, that's why that even exists, because otherwise it's kind of just boilerplate. Um, transform this object into a commit or return it as part of the error if it's not a commit. Okay, and now the rest works like before. And you see, this is a panicking version of it. So if you know it's a tree, it will work. Uh, mm -hmm. It will work just fine and you don't have to deal with an error. However, do we do that here? Try into tree. Do we know it's a tree? Hmm. I mean, it's the same thing again. If you if there is the possibility that this fails, then there's always the possibility that, yeah, <laughs> this also fails essentially. Um, yes. I think for consistency uh, uh, sake, we have to assume that this can fail, yeah. Yes. So this is interesting because we said somebody can sneak in some invalidly formatted commit object, which is why we have to do this. And of course that, could contain, you know, some tree ID that isn't ID, but it's A, 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 A
to trip this code up. And then, I mean, it's really the question, you know, like, do you want to panic or do you want to propagate the error? I guess we already, as you said, we have the infrastructure to propagate the error. It's just a bit annoying that it can fail technically everywhere, especially if you don't trust your input. Um, and I think as a matter of policy, let's not degenerate errors too much. Let's not just panic, let's say. We don't panic. So we can't really do that. So this is why you probably have to do this, decode error, and then find existing object. Yeah, type error or something. Actually, object kind. Doesn't the try into already return an error that you can use? Try into, in the error case, it returns the original object. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we could check for that. We could check it here. Um, but yeah, the way to do this, I guess, is to really match on it. And then we have our tree. And that then becomes our tree. Nice. Or we have our object back. And now we can turn that into our error, which is error object kind. And the actual one is then object kind. And we expected get object kind tree. I think I might have implemented this somewhere already. Error expected. Okay, this is how the syntax looks like if you want to format this, mm -hmm. which now we want. Expected object of type this. this and then we go with expected actual okay oh, there's a typo i think oh uh, next to expected uh, uh i still don't see it strange um the last the last word you mix up the u and the t but god is it here am i no, 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 sorry, two words back in the actual. Um, Expected dot actual. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I thought in the message somewhere. Yeah, it would, of course, tell us that at compile time. Um, I'm sure it would. <laughs> that would be fun if it's just a runtime thing then, which would technically be possible. But yeah, these, this error, fortunately, doesn't do that. Okay, cool. So now we have got full error handling here and full everything. And that's how, how easy it is. Now missing docs, return decode the commit and return, parse the commit and return the tree it points to. God, there is a high noise level here. I hope my microphone does not pick that up. This is it. <laughs> okay, so now missing dogs. Are you good now? Okay, cool. So this now is what we expect. And now we only need message. It should be relatively easy based on what we have here. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, these things, they are really, really expensive. Like if you put anything out here, 
then people could get the idea to just call dot message dot this dot that and every time you do that you will trigger a partial or full decode of the a parsing of the the object and it's fast okay so it's kind of okay to do that but there's nothing that would allow you to do high performance a really high performance stuff because you do waste a lot mm -hmm. and but yeah. i mean for what we're trying to do in the example um there's no there's not really a way around this right i mean you want to read the message you have to the code to commit so you want to find out the tree then i mean there's just there's yeah <laughs> i don't think there's any other way you could do it that's true um there is no other way unless i mean it's all about the api that we are happy with we what happened here did i oh it's the same now we really saved that much okay I mean, the, the problem is the result of the decode or the the parsing we can't we can't hold this anywhere yeah. and i'd hope you know that we could have some sort of cache field here that says here's our parsed object and it's a ref cell so you can just keep it there and it might not be there so ref cell option and then it's something like get object um commit ref we just keep the fully parsed thing this time which also you know is a trade-off i guess we assume people will use most of the fields of the object so we parse it fully but now comes the problem like what's the lifetime here it's the lifetime repo no the lifetime is whatever the lifetime of data is and isn't that repo because it belongs to the commit? It is not. It is not. Because oh, of course. we have the, the data buffer here is owned, right? Now it's fully owned. It's really just that. And this makes it self referential because now this has to refer to that. This is ourselves. And you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Because then you have an object that is movable. I mean, that you can't pin things, uh, but it's no. You don't want it. You will. Yeah. There, there's ways around this using particular crates that do all the boilerplate with pinnings and whatnot and blah. But of course, it's it's a huge deal. Like you don't just do that. It's mm -hmm. uh, and there's always trade-offs. There's unsafe code and it's just something you can't do. Not like this anyway. Not with a real pointer. Not with a real reference. But this is always real references to the data buffer. But what you can do is have an intermediate object, you know, have an extra object that is detached from this one. So they don't, so they are independent because then this whole thing works out fine. Then, then uh, Rust can still tell you that these are connected by their, because one borrows from the other, but that's mm -hmm. all. That's just a typical borrowing, right? That's nothing new, nothing special. So... We can't have an internal cache for this. This, I think it's pretty fine because tree is also one of the first fields here. I think it is the first field. So it can't be more, this is perfectly efficient here. No need to change anything. Um, but for the message, they have to go through a bunch of more things. Uh, let's see, commit ref. So the message is, basically the last thing you parse. So yeah, you have to pay for that. But also like where where do we stop? You know, then we wanna wrap parents and parents should also be relatively efficient. Um, and then we keep parsing more and more each time you, you query and then you have this kind of, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know, this uh, performance that really drops off somehow because you just do all this wasted work you can't do anything about it. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking things that don't cost so much we can put on top and everything else you might just create like this, decode or parse. 
I know I like I like the, the code as a name. We could call it parse. I think terminology is usually using decode and doesn't care that decode of packs is a different kind of it's the same decoding. It's mm -hmm. more like you have two different kinds of decoding on top of each other, but it's still kind of decoding some bytes. Um, so I guess we don't have to invent something new or introduce a new word for that. But yeah, what do I know? Naming is hard. And then we still have this issue that, yeah, I mean, what could it be? This now would be a commit ref for sure. It's linked to ourselves. So now the lifetime is just, um, just uh, inferred. And as an error, all that can go wrong is a decode error. So, which we know is kind of a non-error for most cases. So we can just say, okay, this can fail. And now self data should be parsed. Yeah, but it's okay. Actually, we, we don't have to degenerate this because this could be a nice error if you compile it in. So we can just pass this on one by one. Good object, decode error, right? Like this. And that's all. And now, how would this look like? Decode can fail, and now we have the original object. Now we can reuse it for these simple fields. So now you have a fast path to doing that. Mm -hmm. And all the things that are relatively cheap that you like accessing objects, like as accessing the parents on a high level, accessing the tree like here is something we can probably just implement on top. And for all the other fields, we put it down. And if people don't like that because they expect message to be on top, we can easily put this on top as well, but then you pay. You, if you do a lot of access, then you pay for that, right? Exactly. That's, I mean, that's again something you have to know because obviously um, it's easier to just use message directly. Um, but I mean, I don't know how, how that's usually done, just putting it in the function name, kind of expensively get message or whatever, no. or just put it in the documentation or just not even exposing it. Um, yeah. yeah. Probably a policy policy thing again. Let's try to. So so this would give you high level or let's say perform high performance access, and convenient too because you just call the code here. It's the whole object. Mm, it's okay. Um, yeah, I I really have trouble imagining that you put out an API that has these performance issues um, and you know about it. So now you force people to do it properly and they just have to know if they want high level objects, they try the methods directly on the commit mm -hmm. and everything else, yeah, you don't have maybe, or it's added later. But then you can misuse it, right? Then probably most people will just go with the top level ones and they will run into this. They might run into this issue. I mean, but maybe that's also okay. I mean, that's usually how these things work anyway, right? I mean, you do the simplest or the most simple thing at the beginning. And then if you notice that you need something more, you start digging into the API and find out, oh, there's a high performance version. So maybe it's still this nice trade off between, okay, it's mm. very simple to use, but if you need more, there is more stuff or more API in there that you can actually leverage. Mm -hmm. Okay, then let's go with um, both. So here, the same message and return a B string. Okay, we still have a decode error because we will decode the whole thing. Self decode and just call this essentially. Oh. Okay. So like that. Okay. That 
will do to do docs. <laughs> Let's see if that compiles and works nearly. Message ref. Oh, right. Actually, that's special. What? What? Really? Ah, right, because I call the function now. There's also a field. So the function parses the message because, yes, a standard git commit message can also be parsed. There are certain known blocks, uh, you know, with the signature that you can put there, the signed by, signed off, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And this is what message ref does. <laughs> I forgot that I implemented that. So this is just the whole message unaltered, unparsed, just the default thing. Otherwise, you can, as you can see, you can access uh, the title and the body separately. Yeah. And I think you can do more. You can use this to parse um, different portions of the body as well. Um, all right. So back to the nicest way possible. That should now be it. And it is it. That was easy. Yeah, now we have uh, a nicer way of <laughs> dealing with commit messages. And the next step is to do something about this tree walking. Yeah, now this program here kind of acts as an API test, even though it doesn't really test that it's correct what it's doing. So definitely... Um, At least one call for this should be done so that you can validate that it's kind of doing the right thing. It looks good to me, but yeah, one test should be doable. All right. I think so too. Great improvement. Long session, about an hour. But yeah, this is how you, I guess, implement get oxide, add new things. Uh, we didn't create the test yet, so I guess next time we will do that before we move on to anything else and then never write the test right so we wouldn't want that no <laughs> cool so uh thanks everybody and thanks uh sydney uh i hope to see you again next time for the next episode thanks a lot right bye bye